Hi and welcome back to yet another video. This is the ninth episode of the story about the time when Naruto managed to harness the power of nature in his early childhood due to which he was inducted into Anbu. Let's watch as Naruto Uzumaki takes world by storm. After you've finished watching, please like, share, and subscribe to the channel. Let's get started. Naruto took in deep breaths as he contemplated the new information given to him from Itachi. He sat in his hotel room, the lights dim and the windows open wide, his empathy stretching the length of the village. Happy children clung to exhausted parents, ludened or desperate women clung to unsavory men, and occasionally other women. The festival was still going, and the influx of so many different emotions was slightly jarring. Joy, lust, exhaustion, greed, all these things were in huge amounts, and Naruto wanted to shut it out. It was strange, and annoying, he couldn't turn off his empathy. It was irritating at times. He wished he could block it all out once in a while, but alas, the blessing was also a curse. Nothing was what it seemed in life, and there was no easy. Instead of getting upset with his no-off button ability, he decided to go over what he had learned earlier that day. His friend had sought him out when he was training with Sasuke and Gara. The abrupt welcoming was so very Itachi-like, but everything after was not. Ah, he chuckled, finally opening his eyes. Itachi. They were connected, so Naruto and Sasuke could feel Gar's shock. Uchiha Itachi was the missing nin. He was a man even sooner knew to be extremely dangerous. Gara had been told that if he ever met this man to let loose Shukaku and welcome death's cold embrace. So to see him walk from the shadows behind his shisho with his crimson eyes blazing, it wasn't a surprise when the sand under their feet pulsed with life, ready to fight back the man who the monsters were even afraid of. All but one. We need to talk, Danko. Itachi spoke, ignoring who was present. His crimson eyes gazed at the smirk on his senpai's lips, the bandages around his brother's eyes, the sand at his feet that circled him like a predator, all of this was taken in within seconds with the mighty Sharingan. It is important. Naruto raised a single eyebrow, curious with his friend's statement. You can speak openly here, Itachi. Naruto started. What is so important you'd risk your cover to relay? He asked. It wasn't like Itachi to break character. He was a calm, analytical person, one who could keep a stoic face and slaughter his entire family. To see him even slightly nervous was something new. He glanced at his brother, who stayed silent, not a trace of the egotistical revenge crazed child he once thought would face him. Instead a calm, in control shinobi stood in his presence, confidence leaking off his flesh. His brother was different. The Akatsuki. He started, the words carrying an unknown weight to them. They are here. His eyes examined his senpais, the Sharingan deciphering everything. But you already knew that, didn't you, Tanko? He shook his head. Of course his Tanko knew. He knew everything, it seemed. But do you know who all has come? Naruto narrowed his eyes slightly. Itachi was implying there was more than just him and Kisame. Out with it then Karasu. He used Itachi's Anbu codename, expressing his seriousness. He didn't want to joust with words this time. Itachi involuntarily straightened out of years of habit, his Anbu days flooding to the forefront of his mind. Hi, he began. Hoshigaki Kisame Orochimaru of the Sanin, Sasori of the Red Sand, and myself have all congregated here. He looked his captain in the eyes, blood red meeting molten gold. Our goal is to recruit Sanade of the Sanin into the Akatsuki, and capture Uzumaki Naruto. Naruto was silent for a moment, his mind racing with thoughts at speeds that would baffle most. And then, he laughed. Your organization is so foolish, Itachi, it's almost comical. He shook his head. I am perfectly capable of facing all of you myself, if need be, but I am not alone. He then smirked. Jiraiya is with me, and the two of us together are unstoppable. You cannot possibly hope to take on two master sages at once. Not even you are that thick. It's suicide. He then gestured to Gara and Sasuke. And these two are certainly not useless. Itachi started. We have been conditioning ourselves to withstand your chakra. He explained. You won't be able to catch us like before. That is not a problem. Naruto replied. Have you forgotten the power of a Senen Karasu? Have you forgotten what Jiraiya and I am capable of when we truly seek destruction? Itachi involuntarily shivered at the memory of what the two could do together. Even if Tsunade were to join you, and if you fought like we were actual enemies, we would come out victorious. Arrogance does not suit you, Teiko, Itachi said. Naruto narrowed his eyes. I'm not being arrogant, Itachi. I am merely stating facts. He finally stood from the ground. I'm more powerful than I ever have been. 
Jiraiya has also been studying and practicing my theories on Seen Jutsu. We are so much more than we used to be it even scares me at times. That statement caused Itachi to shiver once again. Nonetheless, he continued when he brought his trembling hands together to calm them. You should be cautious. Those two with you may be strong, but they can't fight on equal ground with any of the Akatsuki, and you and Jiraiya may find yourselves overwhelmed. Sasori was a man who could fell countries with his skills. Every member of the Akatsuki could, actually, and there was four of them all ready to take Uzumaki Naruto down. Naruto smiled. It was a monstrous, terrifying smile that would send lesser men running for the hills. I can't wait, he stated in a voice that befitted a monster. Itachi sighed, his eyes closing in frustration. He knew his Teiko was incredibly powerful, outstandingly so, but there were, at the very least, four S-ranked shinobi, all of whom were borderline SS class, ready to capture him. He wasn't truly Naruto's enemy, true, but he couldn't allow the others to question his loyalty. Their leader was too dangerous to cross, too powerful to openly defy. Itachi decided to further his information giving, the Akatsuki's leader has requested Orochimaru personally. He began. I don't know why, but he believes the snake can give us something that will help us fight you on equal grounds. He really had no clue why Orochimaru was requested, of all people, but he knew it wouldn't be pretty. The old heavy was brilliant when it came to chaos, and when he thought about pain getting any stronger, he wondered if even Naruto could stand against him. Pain was the only man Itachi had ever been wary of. Naruto was his friend, his Teiko, there was no reason for him to fear the youngest Ando operative in history. Naruto narrowed his eyes, his face expressing his deep thought. Something felt sinister when he thought about Orochimaru being of assistance to someone powerful enough to cause his greatest agent even a sliver of fear. Itachi was a man who could and would do anything for his home, and the fact that this leader of his was strong enough to warrant a warning in person meant he couldn't be taken lightly. He was powerful and confident, but he was not arrogant, and his friend was trying to explain something he felt was of great importance to him. So he listened. Okay, Itachi, he started, I hear you. I will not take the Akatsuki lightly. Itachi didn't show it, he didn't show much of any emotion, but he was relieved. So let me tell you how this whole thing is going to go down, he stated in an excited voice. Itachi knew that something glorious would transpire soon. He could tell by the smile on the Kamikage's face. Naruto took in another deep breath, holding in his smirk at his plan. It was devious, and he couldn't wait to wake up and have some fun. After explaining his plan to Itachi, Naruto had ordered the Akatsuki spy to talk with Sasuke privately. They were true brothers, and they needed time to talk. The wounds that scarred their hearts and souls wouldn't heal unless they wanted it too, and with Sakura in his life, Sasuke no longer wished for death and mayhem. He understood Itachi was not the one to blame, he was merely the tool. Donzo. He was the one who would pay one way or another. After the last Uchiha went to a private location, Gara had gone to his own room, taking pleasure in something that was so foreign to him. He took a nap. Sleep was a privilege to the red-headed boy and now that he could afford to close his eyes without fear of never waking up again, he slept whenever he was not needed. It wasn't the strangest hobby Naruto ever heard of, but it was up there. Stretching his already massive empathy even further, he felt Sasuke and Itachi near their temporary training ground, both of the Uchiha expressing emotions that he had just recently come to know as well. Acceptance. Itachi accepted the new Sasuke, the monster who would one day surpass Uchiha Madara, and Sasuke accepted that Itachi was still his big brother, someone he still looked up to and loved more than most anything. Older brother and little brother were once again reunited, and he could feel something interesting. Yes, Uchiha did react, even on a physical level, to highly strong emotional moments. Trauma seemed to awaken power, but love. Naruto's smirk seemed to make the room colder. The world would weep when the three of them were at their prime. The very thought sent shivers down his spine. He then felt a peaceful Gara, which was a stark contrast to what the boy used to be. In his sleep Gara felt pure, like he was still innocent, like he hadn't tasted the blood of hundreds. It made the blonde smile. The assassin's blade would become the monster's shield, and together they would be unconquerable. He was truly forging a formidable team. He could fill Jiraiya, who was surprisingly not drowning himself in women and sick. No, his godfather was actually training. The raw power and determination his sensei was exuding was beautiful and spectacular. He knew that Jiraiya was powerful, but even then, whenever he felt the Toad sent in train or battle an opponent he was always so fascinated by it. Jiraiya could be a lecherous bastard at times, 
but he was also someone Naruto respected and he recognized his power. Tsunade was, as usual, with Shizun, at another pub. The woman seemed to drink more alcohol than Jiraiya, which was no small feat. He knew it was to keep her sanity, but it couldn't be healthy. Even with her insanely advanced healing abilities, her body would eventually give out. A small tug pulled at his senses, and he raised an eyebrow. Yes, Kurama? He asked. We need to speak with you, Naruto. His very first friend's voice rang in his head. His tone was serious and he knew Kurama wasn't in a joking mood. He could tell they needed to discuss something important with him. Closing his eyes, he let his mind drift to his mindscape, where three giant beings stared at him. He looked at Kurama questioningly. Is there something wrong? He asked. Nothing's wrong, Naruto. Kurama began. We just think we have discovered something you may be interested in. Naruto raised an eyebrow. He asked. Do tell. He finished, curious at what they could have possibly discovered within his mind. Your power, it's unique. Sun started. Naruto looked at him as if annoyed. Stating the obvious, are we? He decided to tease the NB. If you don't want to hear what we have to say, then just leave. Sun replied irritably. Naruto held up his hands placating the lava-wielding tailed beast. No, no. He began. Please, continue. Sun looked annoyed but continued nevertheless. As I was saying, you don't use chakra like normal humans. He started. When I first met you, I dismissed it as a freak occurrence. You humans have a knack for developing skills that defy human possibility. Here, Isabu took over. Chakra was never meant to be used the way it currently is. Ninjutsu was forged in the corruption of our father's gift to the world. Naruto was very interested on what his family had to say. Ninchu, Kurama started the word with something akin to fond reverence, was the Rikudo Senen's religion, his harbinger of peace. But like the fools they are, humans saw it as a means of power. Naruto could feel the Kyuubi's malice. The way humans currently use chakra is unrefined. It has no beauty to it, no purpose. It is inferior to the ways our father used it in every aspect. Naruto felt no malice towards him. It seemed the Baiju held him in a separate category. They didn't see him as human. There have been a few humans to tap into the real potential of Chakra. Sun started again. The greatest example would be Senju Hashirama of the Makuten. Naruto actually widened his eyes. The Shodai used Chakra the way the Sage of Six Paths had. Makuten is a very clever Ninshu method. Isabu began. It combined earth and water to create life. Life energy Naruto is a key factor of Ninshu. The pieces of the puzzle began to come together. With a Makuten, Hashirama was able to subdue all nine Baiju at once if he so wished. I thought he was the strongest human since the Rikudo Senate. Kurama took up the conversation. I had never before seen someone with the same magnitude of raw life energy since our father. A monstrous smirk crossed the Kyuubi's face, mirrored by Naruto. Isabu and Sun slightly shivered at how in sync the two were. They were exactly alike, terrifyingly powerful and scary as all hell. Until I met you, that is. He finished in a dark voice. So you're saying I'm like the Shodai? Naruto questioned. I used Chakra how it was originally intended to be used? This information was monumental. He loved to learn, and he was learning something so very delicious right now he was sure there was a stupid look on his face. Somewhat, yes. Sun replied. You of course use Ninjutsu as well, but your core techniques, they are very reminiscent to our fathers. We have watched you use your abilities, and we have come to a conclusion. Isabu started. You weren't born with the ability to use and shape natural energy or feel others with empathy. Those are but byproducts of what you were truly born with. Kurama narrowed his eyes at the boy before them, a suspicious look marring his face. You already somewhat guessed this, didn't you? He asked. The other Baiju looked at the two of them incredulously. Naruto smirked at his first and best friend. I can't hide anything from you, can I? He asked. He chuckled, nodding his head. I knew that my seeing jutsu prowess and empathy were derived from something, but what that something was I had not the slightest idea. He replied honestly. He always knew there was something else, something below the sage dust and empathy, but he didn't have the information as to what it was. You already know the answer now, don't you? It wasn't a question. Say it, he continued at the blonde's nod, speak it into existence. The shared mindscape went silent, as if in reverence. The Baiju waited with bated breath as they stared at what was possibly the most powerful mortal to ever walk the earth. Naruto smirked, his excitement at what he was about to say almost palpable. 
he opened his mouth and spoke what he was truly a master of what he had been born able to use. It was almost ironic, really. Something that was a tool for peace and harmony was able to cause so much death and destruction that even Cage feared. It was chaotic harmony, and it was his to command. Ninshu. Walking through the beautiful village of Kirigakur no Sato was a spectacular experience. Well, walking through the village in the shadows would be the correct statement, but it was still beautiful. Minato knew that once they hit Mizu no Kuni, the Mizukage would be safe. No one would attack her in her own borders, and the Kirianbu that met her there were more than efficient to safeguard their powerful and beautiful leader. That said though, Rohan knew just how important this woman really was. They didn't look at the auburn-haired woman as a foreigner, as a potential enemy. They looked at Terumi Mei as a high-profile target that needed to be safe at all times. She was a lover of the Godslayer, and if anything happened to her. Even Nezumi too didn't want to think what his son would do. With the power at their fingertips, anything was possible. Total and utter extinction was not far out of their reach, and the previous Hokage knew that his son could wipe an entire village off the face of the planet if he was angry enough. Plus, Nezumi too had accepted Mei as his son's love interest, or, one of them, at least. The very thought still made him blush slightly. With that acceptance, came the desire to protect. He remembered how it felt to want to keep someone out of danger again, something he only ever truly felt to this degree when Kushina was pregnant with their child. The Mizukage was somewhat extremely important to Naruto, and his son had experienced far too much suffering and loneliness for him not to have this woman by his side. He was starved of love, and Mei and Anko were the perfect cure. Civilians and shinobi alike brightened the moment they saw their beautiful leader, elated that no harm had come to her in Konoha. Like she had thought, word of the invasion of Konoha had spread, and her people were worried sick. The people of Kiri Hell, of all Mizu no Kuni, knew that Konoha would not harm their cage. Their savior, the bringer of hope, one of the legendary demons of the resistance was there and everyone knew how fond their Mizukage and the Kamikage were of each other. Rumors, more like love stories of war, floated around, most of them untrue. Fantasies of the older, beautiful woman falling in love with a much younger shinobi from another village were the most told. The whole forbidden love thing really got the people going, and it didn't help that the newest make-out series, of romance, more like smut, novels had been exactly that. Jirai had, very unsubtly, written about them and their time together when they first met. The old pervert just changed the names and added a lot of adult material. She and Naruto hadn't done half the stuff he wrote about, but it didn't matter, the people ate it up. Even now, just walking in secret from the shadows, Nezumi too could hear small parts of conversations about the monster would never let harm befall his princess and the bringer of hope loves Mizukage-sama too much to let her get hurt. It was the strangest thing he had ever experienced. Though the fact that everyone knew his son loved Mei was slightly surprising, and the fact they didn't hate her for loving a Konoha-born ninja was something that wouldn't have happened in his time, but the oddest thing of all was how much the people of Kiri adored his son. It was absurd. There may be a treaty between them, but treaties never lasted, and true peace and understanding between nations was unheard of. Yet, here he was, listening to the whispers of their savior, once again watching over Mizu like the angel they thought he was. It was enough to bring a small tear to his eye. His son was doing it. Naruto was slowly bringing peace to the world on a scale he had never been able to. True, he had forced, almost single-handedly, the other nations to a ceasefire, all but ending the fourth war, but that hadn't been true peace. It was strained, and the consequences of his actions were still causing problems. He shook the thoughts of his failure form his mind, allowing himself to bask in the love another nation felt for his son. Jiraiya was right, he would teach the child of prophecy, but he was wrong about one thing. He was not the one Naruto was. He did not doubt that for a second. His son would change the world in more than one way, and he was sure that it would be fantastic. Catching the signal from Okami, the entire team stopped, watching as the Mizukage turned to them going through a well-known Konoha Shinobi code with her hands. It was an Anbu code, that was highly classified. What she was signing was common among Konoha Shinobi, taught at the academy. It was mostly used between Janan and Chunin, but every Shinobi knew it. No doubt Naruto taught it to her. The fact that she knew it didn't seem to surprise Okami, so Nezumi too decided it was okay, it was amazing just how respected his son was in Rohan. He and Kakashi were like living legends within the Anbu Corps, and he wouldn't doubt that they would disobey their Hokage if ordered by the original Nezumi. It was incredible. Mei had requested that Nezumi too join her in her office. Looking to Okami, in respect to the team leader, he was given permission to join the Mizukage. Within minutes, Mei was sitting at her desk, 
with a professional looking Nezumi too standing at attention at the door, showing her the respect of someone of her status. Appearances were everything, and even, though he could kill the woman in the blink of an eye very easily meant nothing when it came to politics. Relax, Nezumi-san, she stated. Please, my office is secure. We are the only ones here, and I'd rather talk to you without the mask of your son, she said softly. Appearances aside, she didn't want to be on the bad side of Namikaze Minato for multiple reasons. The first, and most obvious, reason was that he was terrifyingly powerful. It was said that he was just as strong as Sarutobi Haruzen when the man was in his prime, and every nation that witnessed the third god of Shinobi's wrath still wept and feared his destructive techniques. The blitz had happened nearly 15 years ago, and it was still the scariest thing the current era had experienced. And the fact that he could single-handedly face the QB no Kitsune, even if he sacrificed his life for the village, was something that spoke of his ability. Facing a Baijuu, any one of them, was something no shinobi wished. The second, and most important to the Kiri-born woman, was that the man before her was the father of the person she loved with all her heart. She knew she would be Naruto's for as long as he would let her. She never wanted to live without him, and even now, she missed him dearly. His very presence was soothing, his touch warming, and his love out of this world. He was like a drug, and May knew she was addicted. She didn't want Naruto's father to hate or even dislike her. It was important, because Naruto was her family now. That thought actually made her blush, and her whole body felt hot. She. She had a family. Shaking her head from her thoughts, she looked at the blonde man who was now unmasked. Minato would be her family as well, and she wanted to know he was well respected, both as a shinobi and Naruto's father. Is this better, Mizukage-sama? He asked politely. May nodded, smiling at his manners. Hi, Minato-san. She replied. And please, call me May, she continued. It would be embarrassing if my father spoke so formally to me, she teased. What she didn't know was that Minato had the charisma of an angel, and he could very well turn the tides if he so wished. Is there a reason you wish to speak to me in private, May kun He replied. That particular suffix was like an older teacher speaking to a very young student. A tick mark appeared on her lovely face, and she smiled at him a little too sweetly. Indeed I have. She answered shortly. She obviously did not like the suffix he added to her name. Good. And it is very important that you are discreet. Her slightly annoyed face turned serious, and Minato could detect nervousness within her eyes. Was wrong, Mei-san? He asked, dropping the innocent banter. If something made her so nervous, he would help in any way he could. I need you to take two of my operatives with you back to Konoha, she stated. Minato raised a brow. I have an SS-ranked mission for Mitarashi Anko, she continued, causing Minato to look at her in confusion. They will escort her here in secret, of course. There will be another Hokage soon, and this mission needs to begin before that happens. The utmost secrecy is critical, for what I am about to tell you will affect you, me, Anko, Naruto, and both our villages without a doubt. Minato was now very alert, his Hokage mode active. His son and his village were all he had left, and Mei was speaking as if something monumental was going to transpire. What is going on? Mei. He asked. She looked out the window, very nervous expression marring her face, as she gently laid a hand on her stomach. Hopefully, nothing, she said in a whisper that screamed falsehood. Whatever it was she thought was going on, she hoped it did. But if I'm right, your son will no longer be invincible, for he will gain a weakness, she said. Minato's eyes widened when she told him what she thought was going on, and he couldn't determine if he was furious or the happiest person alive at the moment. One thing was for sure, if this information got out. Naruto's enemies would have a way to hurt him. Naruto slowly opened his eyes, molten gold greeting the world after hours of them being closed. He had learned a lot within those hours, and he couldn't help but smile. He now knew the origins of his power, and he felt a sensation of being whole, oddly enough. The question of what he was and where his abilities came from always haunted him. He thought his abilities came from something sinister, but the truth couldn't have been farther from. His empathy, his ability to absorb, shape and mold natural energy unity, all of it, it was all forms of Ninshu. It almost scared him when he thought about it. If he was this powerful, if he could bring the elemental nations to their knees with almost 13 years of using Ninshu, what had its creator been capable of? Not much was known about the Sage of Six Paths. He was more like a fantasy, a mythical character from a fable of incredible impossibility. He was the giver of chakra, and the man who created the moon. Such things were beyond human capability, and he wondered, with slight reverence, 
if the Rikudo Senen was human. He had spoken to his Baiju family about the all-powerful man, and what they had said had shocked him. He was by far one of the most powerful shinobi to ever walk the earth. There was no doubt about that. He was in the same league as Senju Hashirama, Uchiha Madara, Sarutobi Hiruzen, and his father, Namikaze Minato. His enemies whispered his name in fear, and all the nations, at least now, knew to tread carefully around him. He had done incredible, if slightly monstrous things, it depended on the viewer, and he knew he was a force to be reckoned with. Even still, Kurama had looked him in the eyes, not a sliver of deceit in his red, slit orbs, and said that his father could crush him with the power in his pinky finger. That had been an unpleasant thought. Power was everything to Naruto, and the fact that he was so inferior to anyone, be them alive or dead, irked him like nothing else. This Rikudo Senen was, to put it bluntly, a cheater. The power of his eyes was beyond human grasp, and he was sure that made him an unfair cheater. However, Kurama had gone on to say, with the same amount of seriousness, that Naruto was the only person who could ever reach even a fraction of the power his father possessed. The Baiju had expressed how scary that thought was, because even a fraction of the Sage of Six Paths' power was beyond even their own. That thought had been very, very pleasing. His potential was unrivaled, and even they were frightened at what he could become. Mortals were not supposed to reach the level he was quickly approaching, a mortal body couldn't house that much power and that was a key factor in why the Baiju held him above simple mortals. He was, as they put it, a transcended human, not immortal, but not mortal at the same time. It was just a fancy way of saying, which had been slightly surprising, that with the rate he was going, his life energy would never die out. Essentially, if one could increase one's life force to a certain point, one could live forever. Oh, they could very well be killed but once one reached that point they were usually very capable. This information surprised and, if he were honest, scared him. Everlasting life was not a big deal to the Baiju, for obvious reasons, but for humans it was uncharted territory. But after some time of thinking Naruto had made his decision, he would not live without Anko or Mei, and if he couldn't find a way to give them everlasting life, he would die alongside them. He'd rather be with them in the afterlife than live without them for eternity. He had asked why the Sage of Sixth Paths hadn't lived forever, and the Baiju looked disappointed. Apparently, the first sage wished to leave humanity to the peace he had brought, letting them live on their own instead of under him rule. This had even made Naruto disappointed. Humanity had failed him. He shook that disappointment away, knowing he couldn't do anything to change it. This was the world they lived in, and he wasn't going to change who he was to fit someone else's teachings. He was a monster, and he relished in the fact. Like he had always said, sometimes the world didn't need another hero. Sometimes, what it needs is a monster and he would give the world what it needed. Naruto's eyes snapped to the door before the knock even came. Along with his gaze Sasuke, Gara, and Jiraiya turned as well, unity obviously activated. Letting go of the three shinobi, Naruto gestured for Gara to open the door. He smiled before Gara even held the doorknob. It was beginning. A frantic Shizun rushed past Gara, a look of sadness and slight betrayal marring her face. She was in front of Naruto and Jiraiya within seconds, and they could tell from her harsh breathing and sweat-covered brow that she had been running. Jiraiya-sama, Naruto-san, she began in an urgent tone, Tsunade-sama has accepted the Akatsuki's request, she shouted in a terrified voice. She's gone to meet them now. The room went silent for what seemed like an eternity. And then it happened. Shizun saw it for the first time. Naruto's true, monstrous smile was finally shown to her, and it scared her. Orochimaru chuckled darkly as Tsunade slowly walked with the congregated Akatsuki members, her head hung low. She obviously didn't like what she was going through with, but he knew the deal was too sweet to pass up. With Tsunade on their side, they actually had a chance at defeating the Uzumaki. He wasn't completely useless, either. He could still fight, despite his lack of useful arms. He wasn't a member of the Sanin for nothing, after all. Sasori could overwhelm even him if he put his mind to it, and Orochimaru knew he was no pushover. Naruto would have a hard time facing someone with the skill his previous, and now present, partner wielded. Kisume had been conditioning his body to withstand Naruto's sheer chakra size, increasing his own reserves in the process. He was deadly before, but now he was monstrous. The man held a lot of chakra, and Orochimaru knew he would not fail with the blonde like he did when they first met. Itachi was said to be on par with the bringer of hope when they worked together, and even though Uzumaki increased his strength, so had Itachi. His eyes were, in the simplest of terms, outstanding. 
He hadn't been able to even touch the young shinobi when he first joined the Akatsuki, but now, Uchiha Itachi was someone Orochimaru respected a great deal. He had raw power, finesse, and a tactical mind that rivaled the greatest of Naras. Tsunade may not be as she once was, but she was still by far the greatest Kunoichi, period. Her medical ninjutsu was rivaled by none, and she would allow them to fight even after they were fatally wounded. They would certainly be victorious. And that's when they felt it. They had been walking the grassy fields just outside Tanzaku Gai. The sun was bright and there were only a few clouds littering the baby blue sky above. It wasn't too cold or too hot, just perfect. Mother Nature was completely blind to what was happening. Suddenly a powerful surge of chakra roared in the green fields, causing the Akatsuki members to pause mid-step. The sheer size of the chakra that was brought down on them was enough to send shivers down their spine. Tsunade actually had to remember to breathe, it was that large. It felt like the anger of Kami was forced upon them, and she felt she was the cause of that anger. She tried to stop shaking, finding it incredibly difficult when her entire world was that overwhelming feeling. She was scared. Tsunade. A voice that sounded like Naruto and multiple other, deeper voices screamed from across the plain, of green grass. It sounded inhuman. Without preamble, five people appeared barely even 15 feet away. You disappoint me. That inhuman voice was the young blonde shinobi she had faced, but he looked different. His eyes were the same, gold with slit pupils, but the look he was giving her was terrifying. Ah, uh, Naruto kun Orochimaru intoned. His very voice disgusted him. So nice of you to make our task easier, he said. I'm going to rip you to shreds with Samahata, kid, Hisume said with pleasure. His shark-like features twisted into sick rage. His emotions were that of a man who craved for revenge. He had been humiliated, and he would taste the blonde's blood. He promised himself this. So this is who everyone can't stop talking about, then. Next to the disgusting serpent was someone Naruto didn't quite recognize. He wore the same black cloak with red clouds, so he must have been a member of the Akatsuki. The mystery man was severely hunched over, and the majority of his face was covered in cloth. He felt odd, like he was only partly alive. This must be Sasori, the missing nin from Suna. Naruto was silent, staring at the woman in front of him with contempt. This was no woman. This was a girl who lost her will. She was a little girl who lost her will of fire. To the right of Tsunade Itachi stood, a neutral look on his face as his crimson eyes took in the monstrous amounts of chakra Naruto and Jiraiya were flaring. The amount alone was enough to make Itachi firmly believe they were on a scale not many even knew of. Sage mode was truly a terrifying thing. Naruto Itachi began, his voice holding all the power the Uchiha held. Today, the Akatsuki will have the Baiju you hold, he said, playing along. He had to act the role he was given after all. When Nezumi gave an order, you were a foolish idiot who was suicidal if you denied it. Again, Naruto just ignored everyone and everything, his empathy entirely directed at Tsunade. Her will of fire was dim. It was time to light it up. You have forsaken your will of fire, Tsunade. He spoke in a deadly whisper, his chakra boiling, screaming to be released, to let loose his restraint, to kill. The will of fire has forsaken me, she shouted, her fear vanishing, replaced with white-hot rage. Do not pretend to know me, boy, she continued with her rant. I have sacrificed more than you could ever know for that godforsaken village. All my family is gone. I am alone because of that place. It took everything from me. I won't let it have my life too. She was shaking with rage and sorrow, memories of her beloved grandfather, little brother, lover. Everything was gone. Naruto sighed, shaking his head, closing eyes slowly. He would have to show her. Then. How could you say those words in front of Shizun? He whispered, his voice wavering as if he was hurt just as much as the woman in question. Tsunade's eyes widened, her entire body freezing. She slowly looked at the girl she had trained, who she traveled the world with. She. She started, but stopped when she saw the hurt expression on the woman's face. How could you claim to be all alone when she has been by your side all these years? He screamed, his chakra increasing. He shook with rage. He could feel Shizun as if they were the same person, and he felt her pain like a knife to the heart. How can you claim to be alone when the entire village loves and adores you? He shouted again, their eyes meeting. You don't know true loneliness. You don't know what it means to truly be alone. His chakra exploded, the might of his energy almost palpable. The members of the Akatsuki actually took a step back, readying themselves for an inevitable attack. Naruto, Jiraiya whispered. He hadn't planned for his godson to get this upset. You have lost your way, Tsunade. 
Milwaukee and Dan would be disgusted. Tsunade opened her mouth to scream at him for assuming he knew her family at all, but she was stopped when his chakra seemed to fold on itself. The sheer density of it should have been impossible. He was refining a torrent of pure, almost living energy like it was child's play. So let me show you, he said in a quiet, tame voice let me remind you what the will of fire feels like. The clearing became deathly silent, and in a blink of an eye, Naruto was upon them. I'll take you all on, he shouted, his fist already lashing out at his closest enemy. Itachi fell, his life ended in seconds as the yin-yang natural energy covered fist tore into his abdomen. Orochimaru and Kisame's eyes widened, and Tsunade froze, her hemophobia taking over her. With incredible reflexes, Kisame's blade was poised in the air, descending on Naruto with great speed. Naruto, however, didn't even bother looking the shark man's way, bringing his gaze to the man he knew to be Sasori of the Red Sand. Just before the chakra-devouring sword could take off his head, a wall of dense sand rose from the earth, blocking the strike and pushing Kisame away. Kisame's shark-like eyes narrowed as he turned to face the red-headed kid with the gourd on his back. Before he could yell at him for interfering, sand continuously rushed at him, giving him no time to monologue. A large sound was heard, and a huge cloud of smoke appeared in the clearing. When the smoke cleared, a giant, intimidating snake appeared. Manda, Orochimaru could be heard from atop the chief snake's head. 100 sacrifices is nothing. His smirk was pure sinister. Kill them all, and you shall be provided thousands. The giant snake hissed in pleasure, rather liking the sound of Orochimaru's offer. With incredible speed, Manda rushed at the enemies of its summoner, ready to kill. That's when the sand stopped chasing Kisame, and tackled the giant snake. Naruto just stared at Tsunade, who was shaking. Already on her knees, the blood of Itachi still shocking her. Gara, Naruto shouted, never taking his eyes off of the blonde woman before him. I think it's time for Shikaku to come out and play. He told his newest student. Gara had a faint smirk on his face, still amazed at how easy it was when the Aichibi cooperated. Together, they could truly become the ultimate defense, a worthy shield. The very thought caused his chakra to race through his tenketsu. This was it. It was time to wake up. Sand exploded in every direction, racing in the sky, creating something larger than even Manda. The Aichibi's curse mark ran up and down the sand, forming its body. Within seconds Shukaku greeted the world. Looking up at the towering Tanuki, Manda hissed. Oh it feels good to be outside, Shukaku shouted. His grin was borderline mad, and his eyes held nothing but bloodlust. Let's party he shouted raising his sand arm into the air, ready to swat Manda away with a single thrust. Naruto took a deep breath his chakra once again folding on itself. He could see Jiraiya taking on both Kisame and Sasori with Sasuke, the latter still with his bandages wrapped around his eyes. They were all connected, even Jiraiya, with unity, and Naruto could feel the natural energy that coursed through his godfather's body, fueling his sage mode. With them connected, they all but shared the natural energy so since Naruto could continuously absorb the powerful energy, so could Jiraiya. Neither of them would ever run out if that's what they wished. His eyes then met Orochimaru's, and his rage increased. Orochimaru. Naruto's smile was a mixture of pure hate and overwhelming joy. Didn't I tell you before? I'm going to kill you, Naruto whispered. I'm going to enjoy it, too. This time when he spoke, it was the voice of two entities. Naruto was now sinking with Kurama, and the two were going to rip everything to shreds. You draw your last breath today, traitor. I promise you that. His words were absolute, and with another blink, Orochimaru was face to face, mere inches, with his death. Using inhuman flexibility, Orochimaru snaked around Naruto's punch, his mouth already open, ready to rip his opponent's throat out, when he was stuck with a force that staggered him. He immediately understood what had happened. Your skill in Senjutsu is extraordinary, Orochimaru mused as he slowly tried stand, his head a foggy mess. I'm going to send you to hell with a snap of my fingers, he promised. He slowly stalked towards the face Sanin, his chakra soaring to the point that all fighting ceased those present snapping their eyes to his direction. The earth shook, small cracks webbing through the green ground. Tsunade, who had actually been snapped out of her fear of blood-induced frozen state, met the eyes of someone who was more like her grandfather than she ever thought possible for another human being to be. They felt similar. Their very presence was overwhelming. When bronze met furious gold, a silent message was sent to her with the force of a sledgehammer. Naruto stood over Orochimaru who was still dazed, kneeling in front of him in a haze. He raised his right arm, 
and all the chakra he was bringing down upon him suddenly rushed to his hand. With the sheer amount of power that was forced in the tenketsu of his hand should have exploded, but against all logic, it hummed, like liquid gold, in a powerful harmony that spoke of complete mastery of chakra control. His middle finger met his thumb, and he raised it to the traitor's ear, speaking to the man who would know death soon. It would be the last words he would ever hear. For your trespasses against Kanahagakur no Sato Orochimaru of the Sanin, I sentence you to death at my hand. He met Tsunade's eyes again. Death to all enemies of heaven. And with a sickening snap of his fingers, the most powerful wave of yin-yang natural energy rippled across the grassy plains. The sound was so loud that the village in the distance went up with screams, the shock wave reaching them within seconds. Everything was silent, or maybe so loud that they couldn't hear, as Orochimaru exploded in blood and gore, the entire upper half of his body erased from existence. Ah, he really owed Uma for teaching this little trick to him all those years ago. The message was clear if she was against Konoha, she would die. Turning his body to face the others, which was covered in crimson, he smiled. You want my baiju? You want my family? With another surge of powerful chakra, his body was covered in golden flame. I dare you to try. Staring at the boy, no. He was no boy. He was. He was a monster. Tsunade blinked, a feeling deep in her stomach boiling to the surface, a feeling she hadn't felt in years. It was. Naruto smirked. Ah, so you can feel it? He asked. He had forced a connection between them with unity. She could now intimately feel his emotions, his desire to protect his home. She could feel his will of fire and burned with a ferocity that made her entire body warm. This. This is. She started to whisper. She stood. Walking past Jirai and Sasuke to stand at the side of Sasori, everyone completely ignoring the monster showdown between the Chief of Snakes and the Aichibi. Show me your will of fire, Tsunade of Konoha, he roared. To her left, wood exploded in all directions, as Tsunade's fist met Sasori's husk. From the husk, a smaller figure jumped into the air, his body cloaked in Akatsuki robes. Jumping back to meet his associate, Kisame stood next to the red-headed true form of Sasori. What is this treachery, Tsunade? The puppet master seethed. Tsunade wiped the blood of Itachi from her face, greatly surprising Shizu. The gaki over there showed me something I thought died out a long time ago. She took in a deep breath, her chakra humming in her body. I can feel it again. She smiled. It's been so cold without it, she whispered. She straightened her posture, her sizable bust perking slightly, as she gave a determined look. Naruto, she shouted. Immediately, Naruto was at her side, kneeling to the woman. Hi, Hokage-sama, he said the words with pure delight, his voice his own again, the gold flame still flickering around his form. Send the Akatsuki a message, she ordered. The feeling the blonde had sparked within her was glorious. She hadn't felt such strong emotions in her entire life. Konoha is not a village to be trifled with, she stated, watching as the shinobi smiled. Your wish, Hokage-sama, he rose, is my command, he stated, vanishing in a gilded flash. The words came from behind them. Time to die. Daybreak is coming, and they wish to have what does not belong to them. Peace through pain is admirable, but not acceptable. The Baiju are not mindless beasts. I will not sacrifice their freedom for the grandiose dream of a man who thinks himself a god. My will of fire is as bright as the sun, and the Akatsuki will soon know that they are nothing before the very thing that dawn heralds. Tsunade couldn't help but shiver slightly as the cold wind brushed against her body. She was standing in the middle of quite a few fallen bodies, all littering the ground in a motionless display of slaughter. Each body was garbed in a red cloak, and each body had been both human and puppet. And these few were only the ones that still existed. The others. They had been turned to ash in the blink of an eye by a monster. The entire grass clearing had been destroyed. The land was cracked and spiderwebbed for miles. The air was thick with ash, casting a dark setting over those who remained alive. A good portion of the surroundings was soaked in chakra-laced water, a testament to the powerful Sutan battle that had taken place not 20 minutes ago. The entire area was covered in the brightest, most potent chakra the Sanin had ever felt before. So saturated was the clearing with chakra that she could practically taste it. Death itself had touched this place, and she had never seen such power from anyone in all her years. Uzumaki Naruto, the bringer of hope, who Tsunade firmly believed was the harbinger of death, single-handedly ended the lives of three S-rank shinobi. That in and of itself was a scary thought. S-rank shinobi were shinobi who were capable of becoming a cage, and a boy of 13 had fought and killed three of them. That, however, was not the most frightening thing. 
No, what truly terrified her was the fact the boy did it all with a smile on his face that spoke of dark excitement. The blonde craved for blood, and blood he was given, blood he took. The puppet master from Suna Sasari, his name was, had showed them all things thought impossible with the secret art of the desert walkers. The man, who still looked like a child, had summoned the Sandai Mikazakage a shinobi who was known to be one of the most powerful ninja from the wind country. His appearance was that of a puppet, but he still possessed the Satetsu Iron Sand, which was a huge contribution to his fame. Naruto had been disgusted with the human puppet, and expressed said disgust by smashing the thing to pieces. The Satetsu proved formidable, but the Kamikage had met each construct of Iron Sand with a larger Rasengan, and within minutes, the third Kazekage had been reduced to dust. What happened next had surprised everyone. If quality couldn't defeat the blonde, then maybe quantity could, for well, that's what Sasori had thought at the time. He however was proven wrong shortly after he displayed his trump card, his most powerful technique, his nation slayer. The Akahigi, Hiyaki no Soen, red secret technique, performance of a hundred puppets was indeed the pinnacle of puppetry but, like everything else in the world, it was not enough to claim the life of the god slayer. While the literal army of human puppets stared down the scariest shinobi born since the Yondaime, Kisume had been forced to face the legendary Toad Sanin. Jirai wasn't one to get so excited for battle like his godson, but when he was actually in the battle, with an unending source of natural energy running through his Tenketsu one couldn't help but to get excited. It was a thrill the likes of which were greater than peeping, and that was saying something for the old, perverted man. Sasori had thought he had a chance with his hundreds of puppets ready to strike at the Jinchuriki even the Sinigami was wary of, that was, until that monstrous smile twisted his face. In that moment, Sasori had known that everything had been for naught. For in that moment, he and his entire puppet army was reduced to ash by the most incredibly brilliant katanjutsu any of them had ever seen. Tsunade had only ever seen the technique twice before in her entire life. The first time she witnessed it was during the Second Shinobi World War, when her sensei, Sarutobi Hiruzen, had used it to reduce a significant force of Kumo Nin to nothing. She had been just as awestruck as she was when Naruto let it loose. The second time she was made witness to the technique was at the beginning of the Third Shinobi World War, and again, it was her sensei that had used it. This time, it was against Iwa Nin. The shinobi of Iwa had successfully pushed back Konoha forces to the point where they were nearly at Hai no Kuni's border. The Sandaime had no choice but to make an appearance, since the star player of the war was already busy with another battle with Kumo. He had taken Tsunade with him, and together, the two easily pushed them back. That, however, was not enough. Haruzen wanted to make sure they knew just whose home they were trying to enter. The Sandaime may have been older than most shinobi, but the youngsters of Iwa knew better than to poke the dragon that had slumbered in Konoha for many years. To remind them of this, the third god of shinobi brought Iwa to their knees with a single technique. Looking back at just how powerful her sensei had been, she could understand how he could command someone. Something, like Uzumaki Naruto. That had been the second time she had seen the katan Goka Mekiaku, fire release, majestic destroyer flame, which had originally been an Uchiha technique. Apparently, the Sandaime had passed it down to his shadow, because Tsunade was shown the absolutely terrifying fire technique for the third time in her life that day. She had thought her sensei had made it huge, but when the Kamikage let it loose, the jutsu consumed everything. The multitude of human puppets that littered the ground was the lucky ones, because the majority, along with their master, had been reduced to nothing but ash. Sasori of the Red Sand had been terminated by a child who smiled while he watched him burn. When the Tsuna missing Nin was erased from existence, Naruto had turned his gaze to Kisame, who was giving Jiraiya a run for his money. The Kiri-born shinobi had been a powerful ninja even before he left Kiri, and May had told him stories of a great swordsman who still carried Kiri's prized blade, Seimata. Tsunade had thought his previous smile was sinister, but the one he gave when he looked at the shark-like man literally sent fear into her body, and she could even see Jiraiya and Naruto's students back away from him. Shizun, the poor girl, was forced to cower behind her the entire time, the kind of battle that was taking place since they arrived being far ahead of her level. The monster had awoken, and no one was safe. If they got caught in the crossfire, it was their own fault. At that moment, Tsunade knew that, even as the god I'm Hokage, she'd never truly control Uzumaki Naruto. No one could. The Senju Han couldn't decide whether Kisame was brave or stupid when he met Naruto's monstrous smile with one of his own. The shark-like grin only seemed to make Naruto all the more excited, and the fact that Jiraiya literally picked Shizun up and fled really explained just how dangerous his godson was. 
Tsunade had known that Jiraiya had surpassed both she and Orochimaru when he mastered Sage Mode, even though she'd never admit it. And if a Master Sage was terrified of something, it was a sign to hide and pray that whatever that something was didn't care enough about you to be bothered with killing you. It was a sign of death, plain and simple. Jiraiya had taken her, Shizun, Sasuke and Gara all the way back to Tanzaku Gai in his haste. There, she and the four shinobi just faced the direction the two powerful monsters were to battle, and from there, they could feel the monstrously large chakra the two were washing the surroundings with. The fact that Hoshigaki lasted as long as he did surprised even Jiraiya, and Tsunade wasn't sure how she felt about the two younger boys who were just smiling. The red-headed one was a Jinchuriki who could perfectly, and safely, unleash his Baiju, and even revert back to his human form just as easily. That kind of control over a Baiju was unheard of unless you were a Kumo Nin, and she wasn't sure why, but the young Uchiha unnerved her. His eyes were, covered by cloth, yet he had no problem seeing it all, and the way he held himself was not what you'd see in one so young. He felt, Cold, dark, ominous, yet. She could see a passion in him, a strong passion to protect. His voice were so difficult to read, and so very, very strange. After the tremors died down, and the scary amounts of chakra stopped spiking, Jiraiya had led them back to where Naruto was, and Tsunade couldn't help but freeze at what she saw. It was a war zone. That was the only way she could describe what she was seeing. She blinked again, and Naruto was in front of her, his clothing torn asunder, staring at her with curious eyes. She didn't back down, though. She held his gaze with her own, gilded orbs beholding bronze ones, and after 10 seconds, the blonde smirked, bowing his head to his fellow blonde. Mission complete, Okage-sama, he said. His eyes still held hers, but instead of a scrutinizing expression, he held a bemused one. It would seem she passed whatever test he had given her. She was accepted as the next Hokage in his eyes. Tsunade just nodded to him, not trusting her voice, as she looked at what the clearing was reduced to. Large scars ran across the ground. The green grass was wet with suit and lace chakra. The ash that coated the air felt damp, almost, if that was even possible. A war between two master suit and users had been fought here. A war between two inhuman shinobi had been fought here. A war between monsters had been fought here. And Tsunade felt, oddly pleased, that feeling that had escaped her for many, many years was still blazing in her body, her very veins feeling hot. The will of fire was once again ignited within her, and it had never been so fierce before. She no longer felt cold or alone. Now she felt like a proud Kunoichi, and even though she was still slightly bitter at the village for taking everything she'd ever loved away from her, she was content with her new life. She would become the Godaim Hokage. She would become Kanahagakur no Sato's first female cage, and she would lead the village into a new era, with this harbinger of death at her side. She may have lost everything, but if she gave it her everything, maybe, just maybe, she could make sure that what she'd gone through wouldn't happen to anyone else, with the will of fire. The will to defend her home and people, she felt like she could do anything. This boy, this shinobi, this monster, he had given it back to her. Naruto showed her how to feel again. So lost in her thoughts was she that she didn't even notice the strange, blue thing in his hands until just now. Raising an eyebrow, Tsunade began. What? Is that? She asked, confused. The blonde was holding it by a hilt, which made it even stranger. It was bulky, with a scale-like surface and a mouth. Was. Was that thing alive? Naruto smirked, bringing the item up triumphantly, his eyes expressing his happiness. Seimata, he spoke. The greatest sword to ever come out of, Kiri. He swung the sword in a skilled motion, and the blade hummed appreciatively. He chuckled. I think it likes me. You took Kisame's blade from him? Jiraiya asked. Very nice, kid. He nodded in approval, his trademark grin on his still sage-marked face. Natural energy was, in a way, addicting. It was a very dangerous force of nature, something no man, no matter how strong, would ever take lightly. There had only been a handful of people in all existence who had been able to use it and even fewer who could master it. Jiraiya fell into the former category, until Naruto shared his secrets and now, he was the latter. With it almost anything was possible. Sage Mode instantly placed the man or woman who could use it effectively as an S-ranked shinobi. It was one of the most deadly things ever discovered of the natural world. However, most could never sustain the energy for very long thus, not many people could truly appreciate it. 
now that Naruto could use Unity to link them together, supplying him with plenty natural energy Jiraiya could see why Naruto was so battle craved. With this much power, this much raw strength constantly running through his veins there was almost nothing more pleasing than to fight. It was an odd sensation for someone who wished for peace, but it was because of that peace-seeking disposition that he could perfectly control his emotions. Thus the reason had yet to drop Sage Mode. It felt too good, and if Naruto wanted to keep the link going, he wasn't about to tell him otherwise. What you did with Kisame himself, was also very nice, Senpai. Tsunade's eyes widened. That voice. That voice belonged to. Thank you, Sensei, Naruto nodded to his godfather, Karsu. He finished, glancing at the dead body of his very first human friend. All eyes followed Naruto's, and within seconds a murder of crows was born from the very air itself, and from those crows a lonely figure walked forth, his crimson eyes as analytical and stoic as ever. He was a man whose name was whispered in every nation, and feared just the same. He was Uchiha Itachi, the man who slaughtered his entire clan in the dead of night. Tsunade and Shizun, who was standing next to Sasuke and Gara, were shocked to see the missing nin still breathing. They had for sure seen Naruto end his life at the very beginning of all the fighting. A harsh silence fell over the destroyed clearing. No one moved. Tsunade watched the missing nin stare back at the Kamikage with undeterminable eyes. The slug Sani began to inch herself closer and closer to Shizun, ready to defend the woman she had begun to look at like a daughter, or attack the Uchiha traitor alongside her fellow blonde. Speaking of her fellow blonde, why was he so relaxed? She was given her answer when Naruto smirked, walking over to S rank Shinobi and putting his arm out to him, his hand clenched into a fist. For a second, Itachi did not respond, and Tsunade watched the confrontation with wide, unbelieving eyes. And then, with a smirk the mirror of the blondes, Itachi bumped his fist to Naruto's, the universal sign of friendship. What the hell was going on here? It had been two days since the battle outside Tanzaku Gai. Naruto had explained everything about Itachi being his operative in the Akatsuki, and the truth behind the Uchiha massacre. To say the Senju Haim was greatly shocked would be an understatement. For Tsunade, she knew just how slippery and underhanded Donzo was, and for him to actually slaughter an entire clan because he saw fit too, it made her livid. That little fact made Tsunade a friend in Itachi for life. The Senju and Uchiha always had a rivalry of sorts, and to see that the last Senju was on the side of the last two Uchiha really struck a chord in the ex Akatsuki agent. No, they weren't the last two Uchiha, and he had informed Naruto of such. Within those two days, Itachi had explained everything he knew about the Akatsuki and their goals. It was a lot of information, which was why Naruto had just finally gotten around to speaking with Tsunade and Jiraiya in private. She was going to be the next Hokage, the next figurehead of Kanahagakure no Sato. She deserved to know everything she was really getting herself into. And Jiraiya was their information hub, so he needed to be there just as much as Tsunade did. Itachi was resting in a hotel room with Sasuke, the brothers enjoying each other's company over some tea. It was the little things that counted, and after everything they had been through, they deserved it. Gara was, once again, napping, taking strange amounts of pleasure in sleeping. It made sense, though. The poor Jinchuriki was so sleep-deprived, Naruto wondered if he'd ever catch up on it. Shizun was, like always, by Tsunade's side, serving the three of them tea as they made themselves comfortable in the quite large hotel room. Privacy seals littered the room so greatly that Naruto himself wouldn't be able to break through and hear anything unless he actually broke through the walls. Not very subtle, though. Taking a sip of his hot, fresh tea, Naruto cleared his throat, ready to begin this rather important conversation. Before we begin, you should know, Shizun, that we are about to discuss S-ranked secrets, so if you wish to leave now, you should do so. Otherwise, we'll be expected to never speak what you are about here. Do you understand? Naruto began deciding it was important for the medic nin to know just exactly what it was that she was about to hear. Shizun looked to her shisho nervously, taking a moment to think about her choices. She could leave and not worry about an accidental slip of the tongue, or she could stay and hear probably one of the most important conversations of her era. She sighed. That may be too much responsibility for her to handle, but her curiosity got the better of her. She nodded. I am prepared for that burden, Naruto-san. I would, like to stay. Naruto met her gaze, and after a moment of feeling her true emotions with empathy, he also nodded deciding that she could stay. Shizun was already somewhat of an assistant to Tsunade, so she'd probably be made an official one when Tsunade was announced to be the god I'm Hokage. Very well then. Naruto started. Firstly Sandaime-sama is not dead, he stated flatly. 
his eyes examining the confused ones of his new Hokage. I thought Orochimaru killed him? Tsunade asked confusingly. Jiraiya nodded, his arms crossed. Sensei was killed by Orochimaru, he began, he just didn't stay dead. Jiraiya looked at Naruto, nodding his head, gesturing for the blonde to explain. I've developed a new form of Sinjutsu that allows me to shape sage dust, tangible natural energy, in the pure world. The words this young shinobi was speaking were both incredible and confusing. To her knowledge, Naruto was implying. When Sandaime Sama died, I reached into the pure world and forced Gigi's soul back into his body. I call it resurrection. Tsunade sat very still for a moment, her mind a whirl with thoughts and emotions, emotions that Naruto could feel like they were his own. He stayed silent though, deciding not to intrude on the woman's thoughts. It took a good 10 minutes before Tsunade finally spoke. You meant it when you said you could bring back Dan and Milwaukee. Didn't you? She whispered, her eyes locking onto the ground at her feet. What are you? She whispered softer so soft that only Naruto could hear her. I'm exactly what you think I am, Hokage-sama. He responded greatly surprising her once again. Her head snapped up to look at the blonde, her eyes wide. She went to say something, anything, but no words came to her mind. Naruto continued. I took my first life when I was three, you know. His voice seemed tired. I killed a Jinchuriki when I was five, and I slew the Yondaime Mizukage when I was seven. I decimated Tsuna, Otto and Iwa, and I recently fought the Sinigami for Sandaime Sama soul. This piece of information hadn't reached Tsunade or Shizun yet, so when they looked to Jiraiya for confirmation, the Toad Sanin just nodded, his face the picture of seriousness. All of these things I have done for my village, and all of these things have saved me from what I really am, what you fear. Tsunade narrowed her eyes in confusion. Was he? Reading her mind? So yes, I am a monster, but I am a monster that would burn the world to ash if asked to by my Hokage. I am not some abused child that clings to his abuser in a misguided notion of love. No, I am the embodiment of Anbu. I am the sword. I am the shield. I am the dogs that are let loose when you cry havoc. I am a shinobi of Konoha, and I won't stop until our enemies bend their knee, or recognize what we, as shinobi of the will of fire, desire more than anything. You need to realize this, or you'll never make a good Hokage. The Kamikage's words stuck a chord in Tsunade, and she, actually chuckled. You're just like your dad, kid. The slug signing commented making Naruto smirk. Being compared to his father was something not many, if any, could claim, and it was an actual honor to be so. You don't look like much, but you're probably the scariest shinobi alive. Those must have been some powerful genes. She shook her head in amusement, crossing her arms under her impressive bust. Naruto smirked again, the look on his face a herald of shocking news, no doubt. I'm glad you feel so fondly of my father, Okage-sama, Naruto began because the second bit of information you need to be aware of is that I also resurrected the Yondaime Hokage. Shizun, who was sipping down her delicious tea, suddenly spit all of the warm liquid onto the floor, choking noises sounding around the room as she tried to breathe. Tsunade stared at the blonde for a moment with analytical eyes, her face not betraying her emotions, but, Naruto being Naruto, her emotions betrayed her emotions. Finally, she sighed, shaking her head in exasperation. Let me guess, Tsunade began, you felt the need to bring back that nightmare to what? Scare our enemies with the idea of two yellow flashed? Naruto actually turned his head and blushed slightly, huffing. No, he said sheepishly, before turning back to a slightly surprised Tsunade. Well that was only part of the reason. He straightened, his childish behavior vanishing just as quickly as it appeared. When Gigi died, I was so shocked, so angry and hurt that I summoned the Sinigami. After that, I fought it in a battle of wills, and, because I shocked the thing so much by even attempting such a feat, I was able to rip my father's soul from his clutches. Naruto smirked. Someone else would like to explain the rest. Tsunade raised an eyebrow, confused. Before she could ask who he was talking about, a boy's eyes slit vertically, and bled a crimson red. The room seemed to fall silent, and colder. There was something not human among them now, and it was painfully obvious. A shiver ran up Shizun's body, and she noticed that her hand shook slightly. Tsunade didn't show it, but Jirai knew his former teammate liked the back of his hand. She was tense. So you are the one to replace the old monkey? Hmm? When Naruto spoke, it was not his voice that reached their ears. Ah well, I guess even God has to rest sometimes. The person that spoke was not human, and that was not the strangest thing about the whole experience. Tsunade was forced to think, for the slightest second, that Naruto wasn't ever human, and that the voice that spoke to her was more befitting of him. 
as my partner was saying, after he saved the monkey soul from the Sinigami, we also felt my other half, which was sealed within the Yondami 13 years ago. Naruto promised me that he'd reunite me with my yin half, and Naruto, as you will very soon discover, never goes back on his promises. Jiraiya hummed, nodding his head in approval. It was a universal truth. True men, true heroes, never went back on their word. With only my yang half, together with Naruto, we could face the entire shinobi world if we so chose. Tsunade felt her stomach drop. And now that I am complete again, together, we were strong enough to hold back the death god long enough to resurrect the Yondaime. These were the words of a being that was beyond their comprehension. Why your Shizun stuttered. Naruto smiled, his canine sharpened, and his eyes the color of blood. There are three types of humans, girl. Kurama began. There is the unworthy. These humans are those who are unworthy of not only speaking, but knowing my name. And there is the worthy. These humans are those who are worthy of knowing my name, but unworthy of speaking it. Then there are humans like the pervert and the monkey. They are the respected. Those are the humans that are worthy of knowing and speaking my name. A name is a very powerful thing. It is the title given to one by its creator, and thus, it is the most important thing about them. I was given my name by the greatest man to ever walk the earth, so my name is not something to be given lightly. Shizun was held within the gaze of those crimson orbs, you, girl, are the unworthy. You have not earned the right to know or speak my name. So you may call me what most humans do. Tsunade narrowed her eyes. Being disrespectful was not called for, and the slug Sonin didn't like it one bit. Yutsunade was cut off by the Baiju's voice. Say it, girl. What am I? A sinister smirk twisted Naruto's face, and it didn't look out of place whatsoever. KQB, Shizun whispered. Kurama chuckled darkly, a low, demonic sound that vibrated throughout the room. He didn't say anything after that, though. He just retreated back into Naruto's mindscape, the Kamikaze's eyes slowly fading back to their original Azure. Now that he's had his fun in scaring the humans, let's get back on track, shall we? Naruto said, his voice once again his own. Mentioning how messed up finding pleasure in scaring humans sounded like it would start a conversation Tsunade really didn't want to have, so instead, she agreed. What else do I need to know? The god I'm asked. There couldn't be much more shocking news than the apparent revival of two Hokage. The Akatsuki, Naruto began. We have a plan for them. He looked to Jiraiya, who nodded. Itachi has recently updated their roster information for us. Naruto actually wished he would have killed Kisame now, after hearing of the members the Akatsuki still possessed. There are eight in total. Most of them aren't really that big of a deal. Kakashi and Guy could stand their ground against most of them, but there are a couple that we need to seriously take as a threat. Even me. The thought that someone like Naruto was forced to take other shinobi seriously felt. Strange to Jiraiya. So you're saying that there are shinobi in this organization, it even you. Aren't 100% sure you can face alone? Tsunade asked. Wonderful, she sighed. It seemed that her position as Hokage wasn't going to be a peaceful one. Not necessarily. Naruto began. If you look underneath my insatiable craving for slaughtering our enemies, you'd see that I am not an arrogant ninja. I know I'm not invincible. Damn near unkillable, but alas, I still bleed like any other man, he said dramatically, causing his godfather to snort. After chuckling, Naruto started again. I don't fear the shinobi, I'm just cautious of them. I'm cautious of anyone Itachi thinks is a serious threat, really. It was a common fact. If one of the most badass people you know is wary of someone, you should not take that person lightly. The one they call Pain, the leader of the Akatsuki, apparently possessed the Rinnegan. That one word, Rinnegan, was enough to make Tsunade's blood turn cold. What's the Rinnegan? Chizun asked, confused. The Rinnegan is the dojutsu that the Sage of Six Paths used to create. Well, everything. He changed the entire world with every step he took, and it was all possible because of his legendary eyes. Because of the Rinnegan, Naruto explained. I thought they were just a myth, though, Tsunade said. I housed three Baiju, Hokage-sama. They were created by the Rikudo Senen. He in the Rinnegan, is very real. Naruto replied, Do you remember those three Ame children I trained a while back? I'm? Jiraiya asked. When she nodded, he continued. Well, one of them, Nagato, wielded those eyes as well, he sighed. I kept it a secret after I left them so that nations wouldn't seek him out. Are you saying that this pain character is one of your students? Tsunade asked. Jiraiya shook his head. I don't think so. 
Last I heard all three of them died before the end of the war. He narrowed his eyes in thought. But who knows? It's a possibility. Itachi says that pain is someone only I should try to fight. He's much too powerful for ordinary shinobi. Tsunade nodded, agreeing with him. Then there's the one that goes by Tobi. And then he slaughtered all of Gato's men with the angels he created. Yuki Haku finished his long story of how he and Naruto met. He spared our lives and let us return to Kiri. Ever since then, we've served Mizukage-sama. Midarashi Anko smirked at the girly-looking kid. Sounds like something my soldier boy would do, she said with amusement. Of course Naruto would turn an enemy into a friend, and then assign them in protecting one of the women that held his heart. So, what's this S-ranked mission May needs me specifically for? She asked for the 20th time. She thought that if she asked enough times, they'd get annoyed enough to actually tell her. Mochi Zabuza sighed. The answer isn't going to change if you ask it enough, Anko-san. He shook his head. Mizukage-sama will debrief you when we arrive in Kirigakur. We cannot explain anymore because we don't know either. Anko huffed. It annoyed her that she was called away for a mission right when Naruto was about to return. It sucked. Yeah, yeah, I just thought I'd try one more time. Anko replied. That's what you said last time, Anko-san. Haku explained. Anko rubbed the back of her head sheepishly, chuckling humorously. This was going to be a long trip, she could just feel it. Four days. It had only been four days and Tsunade was already regretting accepting the position of Hokage. Tsunade had thought that Naruto and his students were going to accompany her to the village. They had sought her out and given her the position, after all. But that was not the case. Apparently, Naruto and his students had more urgent matters to attend to, but Tsunade was forced to endure the trip with only Jiraiya. Oh, Shizun was with him, but she wasn't enough to combat the annoying pervert. She was really pissed at the Godslayer, which, in her opinion, was a silly a moniker as it was untrue. Uzumaki Naruto did not slay a god. Yes, he fought one, but that wasn't actually killing it. But no one cared whether or not he actually slew a god. Naruto had become something of an icon around Konoha, and the people ate that Godslayer shit up. Even the civilians were whispering about him, which was strange since Jiraiya had explained that most of the civilians outright hated him, and didn't try to hide the fact. She had immediately gone to her sensei and began treating him the day she first arrived. It would take a little while, but she was sure that he would recover. His body was still broken, even though he was brought back to life, which still confused her and needed advanced healing methods. If anyone could survive it, Saro Tobi Hiruzen could. The mess that was left over from the invasion was going to take her months to sort through. Just thinking about it all gave her a headache, which was why she had a bottle of sake on her desk. Sipping from her cup her mind wandered to the plan Naruto and Jiraiya came up with. Really it just made her job all the harder. Apparently, the Akatsuki wanted the Baiju. And with their members, attaining them wouldn't be all that difficult. Itachi had told Naruto that they worked in pairs, and that every team could capture a Jinchuriki. The only reason they hadn't yet, was because their leader, Pain, hadn't given them the go-ahead yet. That kind of confidence usually was born from arrogance, but when the words come from someone like Uchiha Itachi, it carries more weight. Naruto, however, disrupted their methods. The Akatsuki, with the subtle urging of Itachi, had to finally admit that the Kamikage was not someone they could handle with their system of two for every Jinchuriki. Instead, they would hunt all the other sacrifices like usual and when it came time for Naruto, they'd all face him. Together. The fact that Pain is supposedly more powerful than Itachi did, not bode well for them. Any fight, any real fight, between Pain and Naruto would be catastrophic to the surroundings, and if other S-ranked shinobi joined in. Tsunade shuddered at the thought. The clearing where Kisame and Naruto went and it was decimated. Multiply that by somewhere near 100 and she came to a pretty accurate conclusion. It would be Armageddon. And that, Armageddon, was not healthy for the village. So to make sure that Konoha and her citizens were safe, Naruto and Jiraiya came up with a plan. They'd leave Konoha for a few years, warning the Jinchuriki about the Akatsuki. That way, they decided to expedite their plans, their battle. Which Tsunade seriously hoped she was as far away as possible when it happened, wouldn't wipe Konoha, or all of Hai no Kuni, off the map. Within those few years, Naruto would warn the Jinchuriki, and prepare his students for what is to come. And the Akatsuki wasn't the only enemy they needed to prepare for. Iwa officially closed its borders. This meant that they didn't want to even try to repair their broken treaty. War was inevitable with Iwa, and quite possibly sooner. 
the hidden sand was without their Kazikage, and they lost a lot of shinobi during the invasion. Their borders weren't officially closed, and they did, allegedly, want to work things out. So Tsunade was expected to combat the Akatsuki, repair relations between Tsuna, prepare for war against Iwa, and rebuild and recover from the invasion. Yeah. Why in Kami's name did she accept this thrice damned position? Tsunade took another drink of her sake. Sarutobi Konohamaru was the grandson of the mighty Sandaime Hokage of Kanahagakor no Sato, the very village the boy was named after. He was an aspiring shinobi working his way to his dream in the academy. As the grandson of such a powerful man, Konohamaru was expected to be just as elite as his grandfather and uncle, Sarutobi Asuma, who was a former member of the 12 Guardian Shinobi. Konohamaru, however, was not much more than an average 10-year-old. He didn't have a secret, powerful bloodline. He wasn't a prodigy in ninjutsu, taijutsu, or genjutsu. He wasn't extra smart, and his grades were just above average. There wasn't much that differed between him and the other academy students. He was an average academy student, with only one thing that made him stand out. Determination. Sarutobi Konohamaru never took shortcuts. Ever. His dream was to become Hokage one day, so that he could be seen as more than just the Sandaime's honorable grandson. So he was determined to do anything and everything to become stronger, a disposition he required from Uzumaki Naruto, who he was always really close to, Naruto being his grandfather's right hand. That's why he was out so late, training in the training ground his grandfather granted him access to. His entire body ached from his head to his toes, and he felt like he'd fall asleep standing up at any moment. He had worked on everything. Academy students weren't taught any ninjutsu yet, so all he could train in was the Bunshin no Jutsu clone technique. He managed to produce one copy of himself today, and that was a victory in his eyes. He had also gone through the Kata the Academy taught hundreds of times, and the surrounding trees were full of kunai. Yes, the day had been a good day. As he walked, more like limped, through the silent and empty streets of Konoha, he saw them. And they were taking her, and so did the second and last, special trait of Konohamaru's blossom. Loyalty. Loyalty to Naruto, and his people. So he followed. He silently followed the figures as they dashed towards the gates with her in their grasp, the breeze blowing her pink hair about. He needed to leave a trail, but he really hated the way Naruto told him how to do such a thing in a situation like this one. He looked at his long, blue scarf that once belonged to his great-grandfather Sarutobi Sasuke, and sighed. That's it for this video. I hope you all enjoyed the video. Don't forget to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and follow me on my other social media accounts. Anime God here, and I'm signing off.